Hello and welcome to Crush Your Mountain Health. And I want to tell you, I have a very special uh, guest today. In fact, I have a number of guests who are here. This is probably one of the very few times where I actually have individuals who are part of a live audience coming into our Zoom room now. But the person that they're coming to see, really not me, they're actually coming in to see the, my guest here, which is Dr. Ray Dorsey. Now, I promised that I'd drop the doctor and just call him Ray Dorsey, but just in terms of introducing him, I'm going to, I, I just did that. But let's understand why we're all here. Parkinson's disease is a progressive neurodegenerative disorder that primarily affects movement. It occurs when nerve cells or neurons in a specific part of the brain called the substantia nigra become impaired or actually die. Now, the substantia nigra is the part of the brain that's responsible for the production of dopamine and other, and, and other things, but dopamine helps with your movement and also your mood. So oftentimes individuals experience mood swings and things like that. Dr. Ray Dorsey is the author of this book. Let me make sure I have it right up there, right? Ending Parkinson's Disease, okay? And it's a fantastic read. It's a very easy read, but it really gives so much insight. And I spoke with him um, and, we're going, and I asked, you know, asked him to just come on the show. So let me tell you a little bit more about him. Okay, he is a neuro, neuro uh, I'm sorry, he's a neurologist and researcher specializing in movement disorders, particularly Parkinson's disease and other related conditions. He has made significant contributions to telemedicine and its application in providing care for patients with Parkinson's disease, especially those in remote or underserved areas. Dr. Dorsey has been involved in various initiatives to improve access to care for individuals with Parkinson's disease, including developing and implementing telemedicine programs. He has also advocated for policy changes to support telemedicine and improve healthcare delivery for patients with neurological conditions. In addition to his clinical work, he is a professor of neurology at the University of Rochester Medical Center and has authored numerous research papers and articles on Parkinson's disease, telemedicine, and healthcare innovation. He is widely recognized for his efforts to advance the understanding and management of Parkinson's disease and for his work in expanding access to care for patients with movement disorders. We are so thrilled to have this gentleman with us today. Without any further ado, Dr. Ray Dorsey. Ray, welcome to Crush Your Mountain Health. Thank you very much, Henry. I'm delighted to be with you. And thank you very, very much for the stirring uh, introduction. I, I was blushing a little bit on this. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's, the, it's not just the accomplishment, but it's the heart that we see, because you have to have a heart for this illness. And as you know, it's a personal thing. I have some friends who are present with us today who are fighters against the illness of Parkinson's disease. And I have a close friend who, while he's not here, uh, he's one of my oldest friends, and that's what started this journey. But that said, you yourself, I'd have, I'll have to ask, what inspired you to write Ending Parkinson's Disease, and what do you hope readers will take away from it? Well, I, I'm a faculty member at the University of Rochester, and one of the gifts of being a faculty member is a sabbatical. And so I had a sabbatical about five years ago, uh, and I decided to spend that time uh, to write this book. And when I started taking time sabbatical, I started reading a lot of the papers of one of my colleagues, Dr. Caroline Tanner, a Parkinson's disease specialist and epidemiologist at the University of California, San Francisco. And I realized for the last 25, maybe last 40 years, she's been trying to politely tell us uh, that Parkinson's disease is preventable, that Parkinson's disease is due to environmental toxicants uh, all around us, including certain pesticides, a common dry cleaning chemical called trichloroethylene, the same chemical that's uh, at the marine base uh, Camp Lejeune in North Carolina, and uh, also likely air pollution. So certain pesticides, uh, dry cleaning chemicals, and air pollution are likely responsible for the rise of what's the, now the world's fastest growing brain disease. 
And I came away with the conclusion that Parkinson's disease is likely largely man-made. And the beautiful conclusion of that is that Parkinson's disease is likely preventable. We need not have people suffering uh, with Parkinson's disease. We can um, eradicate and prevent the vast majority of people from ever developing this disease. We can do that not just in the United States, uh, but around the world. You know, that's incredible because so many individuals that are coming down with this illness, they're dealing with so many challenges. And in, in the thing is, you say it's preventable. What are some of the most promising strategies for prevention and how can individuals reduce their risk? Um, so the most promising uh, avenues are to ban some of the chemicals that are linked to it. So there's a pesticide called Paraquat. It's considered the most toxic weed killer ever created. It kills the weeds that Roundup doesn't. It's uh, so toxic it's been used to commit homicide and suicide. Over 30 countries, uh, including China, have banned this pesticide, but the United States has not. In fact, just uh, two or three weeks ago, the EPA at least temporarily reauthorize uh, its continued uh, use. Um, uh, England uh, bans the chemical, but uh, exports it to Brazil, Mexico, and the United States. Um, I feel like it's almost like the Boston Tea Party. We should, uh, you know, dump the the, the British tea uh, into the into the Boston Harbor. We should send back Paraquat, return to sender. If you're not willing to spray this on your farms, why are you giving it to us to spray on ours? Um, so that's one of the things we can do. Um, second is these dry cleaning chemicals. The EPA proposed a ban on these dry cleaning chemicals. Been around for a hundred years. Trichloroethylene or TCE, also widely used in degreasing. EPA proposed a ban on this chemical and its closely related closely related cousin, perchloroethylene. Last year, we should make sure that those bans go into effect. We need to clean up lots of contaminated sites uh, throughout the country that are contaminated with this chemical. And we need to keep our air clean. If we do those actions as a society, uh, we as in members of that society, I think will likely experience uh, declining rates of Parkinson's disease, perhaps rapidly declining uh, rates of uh, Parkinson's disease and live in a world where Parkinson's disease is increasingly rare, not increasingly common. So it's very interesting because I understand that there are also things that persons who are trying to prevent it, so to speak, kind of ward it off they can do on a personal and individual level. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so those are the societal actions. So what can we do as individuals? Um, so since writing the book, uh, I buy organic uh, almost everything that I can. You know, I'm a physician, so I can afford to do so. Um, but even if you can't afford to buy organic, I would encourage people to wash their fruits and vegetables with water and a little bit of soap. It turns out um, uh, many produce, as many people know, uh, have residues of pesticides on them. Even organic produce can have uh, residues of pesticides on them. And some just don't come off with water. Some you need to use a little bit of soap, a vegetable wash uh, to do that. I put a carbon filter, like one uh, you can get in the grocery store, Pure or Brita are ways uh, you can put that on your water at home. This decreases your exposure to toxicants uh, that can be in your water. If you have a well, which up to 40 million Americans uh, have a well. You should have that well tested, especially in rural areas for pesticides and in urban areas for these dry cleaning uh, chemicals. Um, if you like to bike or ski or uh, engage in sports with a risk of head trauma, you should uh, wear a helmet. Um, if you live in a polluted area, I would consider uh, buying an air purifier. If you drive through a lot of traffic, I would uh, consider rolling up your windows and recirculating your air. Um, these pesticides, uh, I would, if you have Parkinson's disease, I would be really, really concerned about, uh, well, I'd be concerned about dry cleaning and avoid uh, dry cleaners that use a chemical called perchloroethylene, which has one additional chlorine atom on it. Um, you know, these pesticides are on people's lawns and golf courses, and so uh, I'd limit exposure uh, to those. I think there's 25, 50 different ways that individuals can take actions to mitigate their risk of uh, Parkinson's disease, and I didn't even get to exercise and diet. Well, you know, the thing that's really interesting to me is that, you know, while organic food as a whole is a bit more expensive, of all places to avail, you know, to uh, make make uh, organic food available, it's Walmart, where people can actually go and get organic food. They have a big section there for their fruits and vegetables. But I appreciate the point that you made in terms of, of washing those things, perhaps when they come home from 
the grocery store and make sure they're washed. Now, the other thing I'll ask you is this, you've been a leading advocate for telemedicine and Parkinson's disease. How does telemedicine play a role in improving access to care and quality of life for patients with Parkinson's? So if, if you think about it, it's a little odd that uh, we ask generally sick patients to see generally healthy clinicians on our terms. Um, re reality, uh, generally healthy clinicians should be seeing patients on their terms. Um, and in the 1930s, 40% of physician-patient encounters occurred in a patient's home. That was the house call. And it was a very patient-centered way of delivering care. Um, the rise of cars, the rise of diagnostic testing, everything moved care away from the home to hospitals and clinics. I think technology uh, is now allowing us to bring care back to patients and to do so on their terms. If you look at Parkinson's in the United States among Medicare beneficiaries, so among people with Parkinson's with health insurance, over 90% of them don't see a Parkinson's specialist like me. Over 90% of people with Parkinson's in the United States do not see a Parkinson's specialist. Over 40% of them don't even see a neurologist. And those who don't see a neurologist are more likely to fracture their hip, more likely to be placed in a skilled nursing facility, more likely to die prematurely. So I think it's really incumbent on us clinicians to find ways to bring care to patients on their terms, to meet the needs of patients on their terms, to address the large and huge educational gaps uh, for patients on their terms. And I think technology is one route uh, to doing so. That makes so much sense. If we think about the the house call. I mean, I'm not all that young, all that old, but I'm not all that young. And I remember when the doctor came over from time to time to check on myself, check on my brother, and when my parents called them, you know. But we look at today's medical or healthcare, dare I say, sick care model, and the doctors they spend maybe 15 minutes with you. And in many cases, they are completely ignorant, if you will, for if pardon, if pardon the word, but they really don't seem to understand why oftentimes a person gets this illness. I've had I've asked a couple of them and they, they almost wax philosophical about, it. well, you know, it's some genetic thing that may happen. It may be something like that. Or in many cases, you know, individuals will say, you know, we just don't know. You know, so it's important that they get that information properly and they have access, patients, fighters have access to individuals who are knowledgeable like yourself that can actually give them the right direction in terms of yeah. what they can do for themselves, please. So you raised a, like a, one, a lot of wonderful points. One, sick care. So out of every Parkinson's research dollar, only two cents is being spent on prevention. Out of every Parkinson's research dollar, only two cents is aimed at trying to prevent the disease. You know, one in eight women get breast cancer, one in eight men get prostate cancer. I don't want to get prostate cancer. I don't want to be cured of prostate cancer. I never want to get prostate cancer to begin with. And if we're only spending two cents of every research dollar on Parkinson's disease, on prevention, or a wide range of other conditions, we're not going to find the underlying root causes of the disease, and we're not going to prevent people from ever developing them uh, in the first place. And if we don't, we just get lots and lots of people getting sick. There was a front page story in the Wall Street Journal just a couple of weeks ago highlighting the rise in cancer among people under 50. And they, uh, they wisely point out that genetics doesn't explain it. Uh, increased diagnostic testing doesn't really explain it because most diagnostic testing for cancer is not done until after 50. So what is driving this? And I think we need to think about what in our environment uh, is doing that. And if you don't answer the question why I have a disease, how in the world are you gonna cure it? If you don't know why someone has a disease, how are you gonna cure it? You know, the diseases we cure, like certain pneumonias and infections, we cure because we know what's causing it. We know what bacteria it is, and therefore we can prescribe the right antibiotic uh, to address it. If you don't know the cause of the disease, it's really, 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 really hard to prevent it. I, I can't think of a, many conditions, if any, that we can cure medically where we don't know its underlying cause. Again, you know, so very true. We have to take that time. Let me ask you this. You know, your book discusses 
environmental factors that may contribute to Parkinson's disease. Now, you mentioned a few of them. Are there more that we need to be aware of, and how can individuals reduce their exposure to them? I think there are more. There are heavy metals uh, that likely are linked to Parkinson's or closely related disorders. There might be a class of chemicals called PCBs that are very similar to some of these uh, other chemicals in their structure that was widely used uh, in the um, electrics in industry uh, use. And these chemicals can get, con get consumed by small organisms and then get concentrated as they make their way up the food chain. There was a study done in Greenland, I think, that showed that people who ate high concentrations of whale, uh, ate large amounts of whale, which had high levels of these chemicals in their fat, uh, many of these chemicals dissolve in fat, as I alluded to earlier, had higher rates of Parkinson's disease than people who uh, were less likely to eat whale meat or whale blubber. Um, so I think there are lots of them, but I think, you know, the three that I get focused on the most, at least in the United States, and this might vary by different parts of the world, are certain pesticides, especially pesticides like paraquat um, and, and other class of chemicals called organochlorines, if you want, uh, these dry cleaning chemicals, trichloroethylene, perchloroethylene, same chemicals in, in Woburn, Massachusetts, same chemicals at Tom's River, New Jersey, same chemicals in Silicon Valley. Same chemical is in uh, Camp Lejeune in North Carolina, and then air pollution. I think if we address those three, we'll take a huge bite uh, out of Parkinson's disease. Now, you mentioned to me um, a while back something called Superfund sites. In fact, your book mentions Superfund sites. And the reason why that uh, was a trigger for me, you asked me, well, what's my interest in all of this? Why am I interested in Parkinson's disease? Well, I told you about my friends. The one in particular was my buddy Kenneth, who I grew up with. We grew up in New York. We went to the same congregation, went to the same we the same ball games. We ran track together. And he was the best man in my wedding. 25 years later, I'm the best man in his. Six years into his marriage, he's got Parkinson's disease. So when I asked you about that, I told you about that, the first thing you asked me is, where does he live? And I said, Gastonia, North Carolina. And you showed something that blew my mind. Okay. Yeah, so uh, anytime someone uh, asks me uh, about Parkinson's, I try to figure out why they have it. And um, so I just did, I'll share, can I share my screen? Oh, can I share my screen? Uh, let's see. Let's make that finish share screen. Allow, okay, you should be able to do it. And so uh, I do nothing terribly sophisticated. Uh, I, I go to Google, maybe in the future I'll go to chat GPT, and I type in Gastonia, North Carolina, plus trichloroethylene. And uh, first thing that pops up is a super fun site. So super fun sites, uh, for those who are younger, are federally designated sites in the United States that are considered among the toxic. There are about 1,500 of them in the United States, and over half of them are contaminated with this single chemical. Um, and so I, I just start reading about these sites, and if people live, work, study uh, near these sites, they could be at risk because up to 30% of groundwater in the United States is contaminated with trichloroethylene, um, and so you could end up drinking it as Marines at Camp Lejeune likely did. Um, it can then readily evaporate, like people know that radon evaporates from the soil and enters people's homes. It can cause lung cancer. This chemical can also evaporate uh, like it has in Franklin, Indiana, and enter the, uh, the schools of kids in uh, Franklin, Indiana, which has high rates of uh, cancer. And so this is uh, just a super fun site in uh, South Gastonia, North Carolina, uh, from uh, looks like recycling of chemical drums, uh, the hazardous substance. TC was discovered in a private drinking water well. I mentioned that up to one in eight Americans get their water from a private well, which is not regular tested, not covered by the Safe Drinking Water Act, and therefore not regularly tested. And it was later found in more drinking water wells. So I don't know if your best friend, you know, was drinking water that was contaminated with trichloroethylene, but in the span of 30 seconds, you can get a hypothesis as to one potential means of exposure uh, for someone in a relatively small town uh, in North Carolina. Now, for those that uh, might see this on YouTube later, uh, he just put up a, a website where we can actually, and I think that's the, uh, was that the um, NIH website? 
That was EPA, and I'll, just, I'll put it in the chat, EPA. too. Okay, excellent, EPA. So, number one, you can go to the EPA and put your town in, et cetera. Or, again, if you're listening here uh, on Apple or Spotify, please check out the YouTube version where you can see the doctor as well as the information that he had just put up. Now, ending Parkinson's disease addresses the need for policy changes to combat the, 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 the illness itself on a larger scale. What are some specific policy reforms that you believe are necessary to make progress in ending this dreaded illness? So we need to ban paraquat. Um, uh, Senator Cory Booker, whose father uh, died from Parkinson's disease, has a bill in the Senate that would ban paraquat. Um, but that has gained little, as far as I can tell, a li little traction. I'm not an expert on policy matters or status of bills, but it's gained little traction because 1.2 million Americans who have Parkinson's disease haven't made their voices heard. If 1.2 million Americans make their voices heard and say we need to pass a bill to ban paraquat, we'll ban paraquat. And we have an election coming up. Why isn't this a major issue? The world's fastest growing brain disease, one that is going to lead to 200 people being diagnosed with the disease today. 100 Americans will die of Parkinson's disease today. It's the 14th leading cause of death. We have a chemical that China has decided to ban for the safety of its public, for the safety of its citizens. Why hasn't the United States banned the same chemical for the safety of its citizens? Are we more? Are we more? Uh, are we immune to the toxic effects of uh, pesticides, whereas the Chinese are not? I don't think so. I think we need to take action to do so. Second, we need to make uh, these proposed bans for the EPA to uh, propose banning these dry cleaning chemicals. So these chemicals, which are known to cause cancer, trichloroethylene is a known carcinogen, according to the EPA and the World Health Organization. These chemicals that were used for dry cleaning are still used in dry cleaning still using dry cleaning. Uh, I think California has issued a ban in doing it, but we're doing this for dry cleaning. This is why we're exposing to people to uh, increase risk likely of uh, Parkinson's disease so we can, our clothes don't shrink. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. And then we need to take actions to make sure our air is clean. Anyone who lived in the Northeast um, this past summer got a real uh, bad taste of what air pollution look can look like. When the skies over the Big Apple turned orange, that level of air pollution is what 1800 London was like when Dr. James Parkinson was describing the condition that would later bear his name. His name. Air pollution is increasingly linked to Parkinson's disease, and it's even more so linked to Alzheimer's disease. Um, I always say if you want to live a short and unhealthy life, uh, uh, breathe polluted air. So those are the things that we should do. These should be on the top of our public health agenda. You know, there's huge support across the country for clean water, clean food, and clean air. These are non-political issues. People of all stripes uh, can see the benefits of clean water, clean food, and clean air. You know, it applies to East Palestine, Ohio, where uh, the trail was derailed. It applies to Flint, Michigan. It applies to uh, Silicon Valley, where there are 15 Superfund sites contaminated with trichloroethylene. This is a national issue. If we, uh, if we elect and hold our representatives accountable for making sure we have clean water, clean food, and clean air, we'll get rid of a lot of Parkinson's disease. And oh, by the way, we'll get rid of a lot of cancer. We'll get a lot rid of ALS. We'll get a, rid of a lot of Alzheimer's disease. We'll get rid of a lot of other medical conditions that people don't need to suffer from for any good reason. Yeah, it's terrible when we think about what people have to deal with just due to the pollution alone in this country and around the world. But now I have to switch gears for a second because something caught my attention and I was curious about it. There was a recent account in, on NPR about a fighter, a Parkinson's disease fighter, whose medication turned her into a compulsive gambler. Are there psychological risks to PD in, in interventions? Yeah, so there are some um, medications. So uh, Henry mentioned at the outset that Parkinson's disease is uh, at a high level loss of nerve cells that produce a chemical called dopamine in the brain. The most effective medication is a medicine called levodopa, which replaces it. There's another class of medicines, synthetic fake dopamines that are used. Um, these dopamine class of medicines is called dopamine agonists. Some are called pramipexol or rapinerol. These medications, and to a lesser extent, levodopa, but these medications, these dopamine agonists, are associated with an increased risk of something called impulse control disorders, where people can develop compulsive gambling, compulsive sexual behavior, compulsive eating, 
um, and compulsive uh, sexual behavior, compulsive shopping, um, eating, and then there's one more. I'll have to remember it in a second. And these things can be quite disturbing and uh, terrible. I had a patient who was a member of the clergy who was on these medications and was, you know, having, you know, sexual impulse control. You can imagine these things can be really, really, really disturbing and disabling uh, to people, their families. Uh, we've uh, almost most of us have encountered families who've lost significant sums of money from compulsive gambling uh, from this. Um, so if you're experiencing these symptoms, you got to let your doctor know uh, and see if uh, the medications might be responsible because the easy, these are readily treatable. You can slowly decrease the amount of medication someone is on and usually the symptoms uh, abate or certainly lessen. You know, we talked about Parkinson's disease proper, but there's a thing called Parkinsonism. Could you talk a little bit about that? And perhaps what can be done for individuals who are dealing with Parkinsonism due to the other circumstances. Tell us a little bit about it and explain it for us, please. So Parkinsonism is just a broad umbrella term, and it means that you have two of the following core symptoms. You have a rest tremor, usually in your hand, usually asymmetric. Um, you have slowness of movement, you have stiffness or rigidity, and you have difficulties with gait or balance. If you have two or two of the following four, tremor, slowness, movement, stiffness, trouble walking, you have Parkinsonism. Now, there's a wide range of causes of Parkinsonism. The most common cause is Parkinson's disease, maybe 60 to 70 percent. But there are other things, medications, uh, side effects of antipsychotic medications can cause people to become Parkinsonian. And again, readily treatable, usually by reducing, substituting or eliminating uh, medications. And then there are a host of conditions often with worse prognoses, things like multiple system atrophy, progressive supernuclear palsy. Um, that are also um, that also can cause Parkinsonism. These things are usually harder to treat. If you have one of these conditions, I think it's even more imperative that you try to find your way to a Parkinson specialist uh, so you can get appropriate uh, care and treatment for those conditions. Well, now let me ask. Let me ask you this, and I appreciate that information. Uh, would you mentioned that some of them can be due to antipsychotic uh, medicines and things like that? Uh, what would be an alternative or, you know, for some of those medicines? Um, so uh, many of these antipsychotic medicines block the chemical dopamine. So you mentioned at the outset that Parkinson's disease is loss of nerve cells that produce dopamine. You can get the same, almost the same biological effect by just blocking the effects of dopamine. It turns out not all antipsychotics block dopamine, not all antipsychotics block dopamine to the same extent. So you can use antipsychotic medications that are less likely to block a dopamine that do so in, in, in a, um, with uh, less effect. Um, these things obviously need to be discussed with your psychiatrist, um, especially if you have a good reason to be on these medications. Many times, sometimes people are prescribed these medications, excuse me, without a good reason for them. And so sometimes you just don't need the medication. Um, so those are things that you should discuss with your local clinician. Can you discuss some of the challenges and uh, and opportunities in raising awareness and funding for Parkinson's research as and initiatives? Yeah, it, the only way we uh, change diseases. So we've made huge uh, changes in polio. We've made huge changes in HIV. We've made huge changes in drinking and driving. All of those efforts, you know, we live in a world that's largely free of polio. We live in a world where drinking and driving is socially unacceptable. We live in a world where HIV is both preventable and treatable. All of those campaigns were led by people who were most directly affected by the disease. They were not led by uh, scientists or uh, neurologists or clinicians. They were led by people who were most directly affected by the disease. The March of Dimes, which raised um, millions of dollars for polio, was led by ordinary Americans literally mailing in their dimes to the White House, which allowed Jonas Salk, a scientist, 17 years later to develop an effective vaccine for polio. Swimming pools, churches, schools, houses of worship were no longer closed every summer because of fear of polio because a community came together to raise funds and awareness uh, for polio and we live in a world that's largely free of polio. We still today in 2024, we can't cure polio. We have no highly effective treatments for polio. We just live in a world where polio just doesn't occur. In 1980, uh, 
the daughter, a 12 year old daughter of Candace Leitner was struck by a, a driver who was drunk, who had been arrested uh, a, a week earlier, I believe, for drinking and driving, knocked her 12 year old daughter out of her shoes. She was walking and was uh, thrown and died. Four days after her daughter dies, she is lobbying legislators um, uh, to take laws to make drinking and driving illegal. In 1980, when she starts her campaign, uh, drinking and driving is still permissible in some states. It was legal to drink and drive in some states. The uh, drinking age was 18. Uh, blood alcohol level levels uh, permissible were much higher than they are today. Eight years later, eight years later, just in the span of eight years, uh, drinking and driving is illegal in all 50 states. Drinking age is raised to 21. Blood alcohol levels drop to either 0.1 or 0.08. Uh, because of the efforts of Candace Leitner and Mothers Against Driving, including perhaps some people listening right now, thank you, 10,000, 10,000 fewer people die each year from drinking and driving than they did in 1980. That's 10,000 children not killed. That's 10,000 schools not torn apart. That's 10,000 communities that aren't grieving. That's 10,000 families that aren't bearing their children from drinking and driving, entirely preventable. All because an ordinary woman, an extraordinary woman, uh, Candace Leitner made her voice heard and others followed. In 1981, uh, a newspaper article in the New York Times reported high rates of a rare cancer in gay men in New York City, um, and they didn't know why. Uh, we were confronted with an unknown, uniformly rapidly fatal uh, illness that was killing uh, large numbers of people without any great explanation. We had no uh, robust federal response to this. People were blamed uh, for their own diseases. This isn't COVID-19, this is uh, HIV. In that setting in 1987, an ordinary, extraordinary uh, man, Larry Kramer, who recently passed away, uh, formed an organization called ACT UP, and their motto was silence equals death. Silence equals death. Because for uh, people with HIV in New York and San Francisco and throughout the United States and around the world, HIV in the early 80s was a fatal death sentence. There were no highly effective treatments. There were no vaccines. There was no even known what was causing the virus, what was causing the disease. It wasn't until later that was found to be uh, a virus in a new class uh, or relatively new class of viruses. Because of their work in 1987, in 1995, we have introduced a new class of medications called protease inhibitors that allow people to live near normal life expectancies. Think Magic Johnson. And they identified that the disease was sexually transmitted. So we uh, started using condoms in great numbers. And millions, millions of people in the United States and around the world have not developed HIV because of the heroism of people like ACT UP. It is likely, almost certainly, that people listening to your podcast today, someone does not have HIV because of the efforts of Larry Kramer, and they don't even know it. It could be you, it could be me, it could be anyone uh, participating on this. These are huge gifts that ordinary Americans bestowed on future generations. We have an obligation to receive those gifts, and we have an obligation to reciprocate. And it's time for our generation to rise up, make our voices heard, and say that we need not live in a world where Parkinson's disease affects 1.2 million Americans. We need not live in a world where Alzheimer's disease affects over 6 million people. We need not live in a world where ALS is uh, paralyzing people uh, in the primes of their lives. We need not live in a world where children develop intellectual disabilities and autism because of the widespread use of pesticides. We need not live in a world where brain cancer and other cancers are increasingly common in people under the age of 50 because of our environment. We need to wake up, make our uh, air clean, our food clean, and our water clean, and live longer, healthier, happier, more productive lives. Indeed, I appreciate your passion about this. It's clear that not only are you knowledgeable, but your heart and soul is in the is is in the fight as well. And so that's why I wanted to bring you on because so many individuals need to hear the, about hear more about this illness. There are individuals here that have questions. There are individuals here that, that, that need direction. So thank you so much for your information. For readers who may have love of a loved one. In, uh, who, have, who have Parkinson's disease, what advice would you give them based on your own experience and your insights? 
Yeah, so Parkinson's doesn't just affect uh, people with the disease, it affects people around them. Uh, you mentioned your passion for it uh, because of your best friend. Um, and I think we need to realize that, that uh, the suffering doesn't begin and end with the person with the disease. It extends to their family members uh, and beyond. Uh, one person told me the first thing that happens uh, after you, you develop Parkinson's disease is that your phone stops ringing, that uh, there's a social isolation uh, that happens. Um, we need to reach out and touch the people that we care about, and especially the people that we care about that are going through difficult uh, times. Uh, and if you're a caregiver, caregivers can't do it by themselves. There are about 40 million caregivers in the United States, and the leading cause for caregiving in the United States is uh, brain diseases. And we need to provide greater support uh, for them. If you have the disease, you need to make sure your caregiver gets a break. Um, if you can afford it, you should have someone come in and help take care of you or friends and family take care of you because a caregiver can't do it by themselves. We know that caregivers, that caregiving is hazardous to your health. Caregivers are increased risk for uh, depression, increased risk uh, for higher risk of death. And a caregiver can't be an effective caregiver if they're not healthy and supported. Um, so these diseases not don't just affect the people with it, they affect everyone around them and we need to make sure there's adequate support. But the beautiful thing is that we can eliminate these diseases altogether. You know, not many people are caring for people with polio today because we summon the will and the resources to prevent the disease from ever occurring. And if we did the same thing uh, for Parkinson's disease, we'll make a difference, not just for 1 million Americans, 1.2 million Americans with uh, Parkinson's disease, we'll make a difference for a lot of caregivers around this country. Well, I really appreciate your insights, your presence today, your passion. I know you you took some time out of your busy schedule. You got a lot going on. And so I want to thank you so very much for this. You know, all of us deal with illness one way or another, through, either through a loved one or ourselves. And, and when one person in the family is sick, all individuals are ill in the family because you have to take care of that person. And it can be nerve wracking. I lived it personally, so I know what it's about. So another reason for my passion for this sort of thing. Doctor, got one more question for you. Ray, I've got one more question for you, okay? With all of your insights and all of the passion that you bring, Ray Dorsey, what does it mean to you to crush your mountain? Um, so for the last five years, I've been trying to climb the mountain of uh, Parkinson's disease. And the more I climb, the more I dig, the more I, the more I see, the more convinced I become that this disease is preventable. I think Parkinson's disease, the vast majority of it is preventable. We need not live in a world that, uh, where Parkinson's disease is a, is a plague upon us. And if we take actions, we can create a world where the mountain of Parkinson's disease is maybe a small hill and where future uh, generations see it as a, just a small mound and future generations as see it as a of historical interest, much like the way we look at polio, much the way we look at typhus, smallpox, and a whole range of other diseases. And the other beauty is that the more I've uh, been climbing this mountain of Parkinson's disease, the more I've been seeing other uh, mountains uh, that are part of the same range. And other diseases that are part of that same range may be ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, uh, Alzheimer's disease, intellectual disabilities, autism, um, I think there are a wide range of brain diseases that are being driven by the environmental toxins in our food, water, and air. We're creating a, a symposium to address these things. And I think we can crush the mountain of Parkinson's disease. And if we crush the mountain of Parkinson's disease, we can crush the mountain of a lot of other brain diseases and a lot of cancer in the process. And as a neurologist, as a physician, I can't think of a greater gift to future generations than one where the diseases that I'm responsible for uh, caring for uh, simply don't exist. You know, we look forward to a time, many of us, many of us here in this space look forward to a time when no one will say, I am sick. And that uh, is a wide discussion that we would love to keep going, but we can't. I know our time is uh, fleeting, um, but do you have a couple of minutes to take a, a question or two? Yes, and um, uh, for any of you, our book is available on Amazon. Uh, all the authors are donating all of our proceeds to efforts to prevent and end the disease. It's ending Parkinson's disease. If for any reason you can't afford a copy of the book, and I know there are people who can't, you can just email us at info at endingpd.org. 
and we'll send you a free copy. Just email us info at endingpd.org. Say you'd like a copy and give us your mailing address and we'll send you a free copy. Um, we're delighted to be uh, on your show, Henry, and delighted to answer any questions that you and your audience have. Excellent. So if you'd like to raise your hand at this point and um, we can call on you or or I believe we have um, I have some, someone manning the chat or if, if Karen would like to read a, a um, read one of those questions that are in the chat. Sure, I can do that. The question is, the worst time for my symptoms of shaking is when I wake up during the night. And about a half hour when I wake, it stops. And I feel great until I take my morning pill. I don't understand why. Um, so it's hard to say, and I can't give medical advice here. But in general, uh, people with uh, Parkinson's disease, they take their medicines during the daytime. And the point of the medication is to relieve their symptoms. Um, as you can imagine, when you go to bed at night, you go long periods of time without the medicine. So some people will wake up or have trouble turning in bed or trouble walking to the bathroom at two or three in the morning or uh, have a lot of trouble shaking. Sometimes there are longer formulations of the medications that you can take at bedtime to help relieve uh, those symptoms. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Any further questions? No? Well, that's it. Karen, do you see another question that's uh, listed there? Looks like I see one. It's not a question. Okay. Okay, well then that's cool. I'll tell you what, you know, again, I wanna thank you again, Dr. Ray, for being on here. Um, now friends, next week, for those of you who might be interested, let me I take that back. It's not gonna be next week because it will take me some time to put everything together. But we have a very special individual who is a Parkinson's disease fighter like yourselves. What's interesting about Tom is that he's developed a number of devices to help individuals with Parkinson's disease. One of which in particular helps eliminate the shuffling walk when you play, put it on. So when that is available, I will actually send a link in the chat if you'd like to be part of that audience, individuals that uh, the first 10 individuals first 10 individuals that are able to make it at that point and today is the 19th monday 19 the 19th of february 2024 when this goes up and you are present the first 10 who are available will get a um a complimentary a complimentary device for you and we'll let you know how to put it on and things like that i have watched this man he's a good friend of mine and i've seen him without it and then he put it on, you wouldn't know he had Parkinson's disease pretty much by his walking. So again, that's something that's coming up in the next couple of weeks. But in the meantime, we want to thank the good doctor for his, his, his presence here. Ray, you're an amazing guy. Um, you probably know that Ray is, is, is Latin for king. So, you know, so you are, the, you, you are the king warrior against the fight for Parkinson's disease. And we're glad to have you with us. And we're glad to have everyone that attended today. And in the meantime, as I always say, don't give up in whatever endeavor that you have. Make your doctor your partner, not your boss. And whatever you do, don't just climb your mountain. Crush them. We'll see you next time. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you.